welcome to the Haunted Haulers podcast, a place where your hosts, Wendy and April, discuss the creepy things that lurk in the misty shadows of the Appalachian Hills. I am, as always, the mysterious voice in the walls. Hello, everybody. I'm Wendy. And I'm April. Today's tale comes from Pikeville, Kentucky, and centers around the heartbreaking life of Octavia Hatcher and includes one of many people's biggest fears, being buried alive. Octavia Smith was born to Jacob and Pricey Smith on May 21, 1870. Her father was well-to-do in the community and made his living as a dry goods salesman. He was one of the early settlers of Pikeville and owned much more real estate than most other settlers. At the age of 19, Octavia met and married 30-year-old James Hatcher. James, the son of A.J. and Mary Hatcher, was a self-made businessman who became very powerful and wealthy because of his smart business investments. By all accounts, James was madly in love with Octavia and felt she was truly the love of his life. Early into their marriage, Octavia became pregnant with the couple's first and only child. In January 1891, their son Jacob was born. What should have been the happiest time of their lives turned into the darkest. Tragically, Jacob only lived for a few hours after coming into the world. Octavia was lost in a deep depression and became ill. In April of 1891, she became bedridden and fell into what many people described as a coma. Doctors at the time could find no explanation for this, and on May 2, 1891, she passed away. She was believed to have died from an unknown illness. Due to the fact it was unseasonably hot that time of year, and she was not embalmed, she was buried rather quickly. However, not long after her burial, it was discovered that other people in Pikeville were falling into the same coma-like state as Octavia had, but they were not dying from it. Octavia's husband and other family members became concerned that Octavia might not have actually died and quickly had her body exhumed. It is widely said that when they opened the casket, her face was contorted in a grimace of complete terror, her nails were bloody and broken, and the lining of the casket had been shredded. The family's worst fear had been true. Octavia had not been dead when she was put to rest, and she had awakened from her coma underground and in a terrified frenzy attempted to escape her coffin until death finally took her. James was absolutely devastated. He had Octavia reburied, and a year later, he commissioned a life-size marble statue of her to be set on top of her grave in memorial. The statue is said to be an exact likeness of Octavia, as it was created from a cabinet photograph of her. She was depicted in a dress in the style of the time and was holding the handle of a parasol in her right hand. Later on, James built the Hatcher Hotel on Main Street in view of the memorial statue so that he could feel as if Octavia was always looking over him. His hotel was more than just your average hotel. James was a history buff, and the hotel also served as a museum that contained many strange and unusual artifacts, and the walls of the lobby were covered with quotes and sayings that he found interesting. Octavia's picture, the same one used to create the monument, hung in a prominent pace in the lo- place in the lobby as well. One of the most surprising items he kept in his museum was his own custom-built coffin, which is said to have been fashioned to prevent him from being buried alive. Reports are mixed as to what special considerations this coffin contained to prevent premature burial, but one story suggests that when James died, a string would be attached to his finger and run above ground, where it would attach to a bell he could ring should he awaken in his grave. James Hatcher lived a full life, but he never remarried. He died in October 1939 at the age of 80, after nearly 50 years of being separated from the wife he loved so deeply. There are many stories of Octavia's grave being haunted. One well-known story is that on the anniversary of her death, her statue would spin around, turning her back on the town and the people who allowed her to be buried alive. Although the stories of her death and burial have many variations, one thing remains the same. Many who have visited her cemetery have experienced strange occurrences. According to the American Hauntings website, a woman named Herma Shelton interviewed people who lived on the hill by the cemetery and found the following stories. One couple had lived there over 30 years and had recently been experiencing the sound of a woman weeping coming from the grave for several nights. The noise was investigated but no one was found to be in the cemetery. 
Another couple reported that they walked into the graveyard because they heard a kitten crying in the darkness. As they approached the Hatcher grave, where the sound was coming from, the crying stopped. In addition to hearing cries, others who lived nearby reported seeing a misty specter near her grave. Some reporters claimed to feel depressed and anxious around the grave. Many are too afraid to go after dark. Was Octavia buried alive? Is she still haunting the area where her marble likeness stands to watch over the town? The only thing we know for certain is that two lives were taken from this world far too soon in this tragic story. And now it's time to break down this story. So what do we got? So there's a lot of different variations of the story. As we were researching and reading, you know, one story will say one thing, one story says another. There are different uh, theories as to what kind of sickness may have caused her to fall into this coma-like state. Um, So I think it's really interesting to look at the way the story is kind of warped and told differently depending on which source you're looking at. Mm -hmm. So we know that Octavia, the, the part about her getting sick, we know for sure that that happened because in all of the stories about James Hatcher's life, he constantly referenced her death. You know, that was the loss of the love of his life. It really affected him as a person. So that part is pretty solid. We know that that happened. And when we look at the different stories about what happened to her, there were all these different theories. So the first theory was that the Setsy fly had caused this sleeping sickness. And so she wasn't truly dead when she was buried. But if you do a little research into that, the Setsy fly comes from Africa. And so I find it a little bit ludicrous to think that this fly somehow managed to make it to the United States and land in Pikeville, Kentucky. It it got on a bag of flour. (laughs) It was on a train. Then it went across the ocean. (laughs) Then it hopped on another train. It totally holds up. Okay, and it's funny you say that voice in the wall because there is one theory that, you know, maybe where he was a trader, where he was a businessman, that maybe uh, the fly did come over on something. Maybe, I think it was from Italy. That... Well, they talked about how there was a similar sickness going on. Not really that it was from the Setsy fly, but that there was a similar sickness going mm-hmm. on in Italy at the time. And he did import lots of different things. So there's a possibility that maybe he imported something from Italy that had picked up this disease or that had these germs on it. And then she came in contact with it. To me, that one holds up a little bit more than, right. oh, she was bitten by a setsy fly that caused this sleeping sickness. So, truce, we do know. She did have a baby. She did have a baby. The baby didn't live long. Tragic story. Yes, very tragic. And, you know, as mothers, that is... That That's- is- that's enough to, yeah. to really throw anybody into, you know, and it's talked about how she went into this deep depression into first. Depression. I and can she see became that. I can understand that. Bedridden. I mean, to me, it sounds to me like she died from a broken heart. Right. Honestly. And yeah, that that makes more sense to me than some fly that from another country coming over and causing her to, you know, to die from that or fall into a coma. Um, what about, though, the fact that other people... We're going into this state. So that's part of the the legend or the story is that other people were also going into this. But when you start doing some digging and some research, I couldn't find any legitimate documentation that other people were having any kind of a sickness that was causing them to go into a coma and then come out of it weeks or days later. And that's the problem. One of the problems with this story there was nothing in the newspapers. Um, nothing could be found. You know, this is a small town. Mm-hmm. If people were going into comas over some fly or some other reason, you would think that would make the news. Yeah. If, well, if you just had a rash of like three or four people all going into a coma, that'd have to make the news. Mm-hmm. Like, you got to fill the newspaper with something, and that would be a big story. Mm-hmm. Especially in a small town like Pikeville at the time, and and you know we know that this was you know way early on, um, and that there wasn't word of mouth travels. You can't keep something like that quiet in a small town, no matter how rich the family may be. One of the stories that I read said that well, you know, the Hatcher family was very rich and powerful, which is true. There is documentation of that. And they said, well, if they didn't want people to know that this man's wife had been buried alive, you know, they would have found a way to keep that out of the news. Which, you know, rich and powerful people can do a lot of things, but 
coming from small town Appalachia mm-hmm. and knowing how things work in small town Appalachia, if something like that had truly happened, people are going to be talking people about it. People are going to talk. If people want to talk, they're going to talk. Right. And another interesting thing, in one of the sources that we looked at for this, it talked about how the, the person wanted to not debunk the story, but they really wanted to find some actual basis and fact in it. And so when they went back and were trying to find like the old newspaper archives, a few months before her death and a few months after her death, those archives are just gone. They're missing. They don't hmm. exist. And so you can't find her obituary anywhere. Um, and I think that's really interesting because if we actually had her obituary to look at, you know, a lot of times stuff like that gets mentioned in obituaries, especially during that time period. They would put a lot of the details about the person's life. And so that would be a really interesting piece of information to examine, but it just doesn't exist out there anymore. And something else, uh, talking about the newspapers, um, something else that wasn't found in the newspapers is the fact that she was buried alive. Um, That couldn't be found reported in any of the newspapers. Even when her husband died uh, later, it wasn't seen in his obituary. And apparently at the time when the spouse died, if the husband would die and if something scandalous happened with the wife, that would show up in his obituary. But apparently it didn't show up there either. So that makes me wonder... The validity, if it wasn't found in either the newspaper or his obituary about this happening to Octavia. Right. And, you know, we know that he talked about her throughout the entirety of his life. Yes. You know, anytime he would write a letter to somebody, inevitably, and we have copies of those, they're, they exist out there. Anytime he would write, a, write to anyone or talk to anyone or do an interview with anyone, Octavia was always mentioned. So I find it really hard to believe if this truly happened to her and you know, when he passed away, that that wasn't mentioned. And even if it was true that, oh, this happened and he didn't want it to get out and he was very rich and powerful and was able to keep that from being told, when he died, what was there left to to hide? You know, what would have kept them from coming out with it at that point? Right. He obviously loved her. Not only was he buried at the foot of her grave um, to be close to her when he died, but he never remarried. Right. Um, Lived the rest of his life and never moved on. Mm -hmm. And they were young when she died. Yeah. So, yeah, you can. he definitely loved her. Well, I think it's interesting that you, you mentioned that he was buried at the foot of her grave because so much of the legend or the story kind of revolves around her grave and the monument that he had created for her. Uh, at one point... Uh, it was told that, you know, on the anniversary of her death, that the statue would turn on its pedestal and turn its back to the town. And and that was kind of symbolic of how the town had turned their back on her and how they had let her be buried alive. And so I think that was really interesting because if you look at the stories about the headstone and the monument that was created, there's a lot of things that are told about that that are not factual either. We read several different articles about it that talked about how her statue was holding baby Jacob in her arms and that that part of the statue had been broken off. And it is true that part of the statue has been broken off. And I'm going to post some pictures of the the monument and the grave site on our Instagram page so that you guys can check it out. So her right hand is missing in the the pictures of the the monument today. But if you look at the way that that's crafted, there's no way that that hand was cradling a baby. You know, baby Jacob is buried at the foot of her uh, monument as well, and he has a little gravestone that has a little infant laying on top of it. And so I think that kind of became convoluted. People saw that. They saw that her hand was missing, and they thought, oh, well, baby Jacob was broken off, and now he lays at her feet. But that was actually just part of his headstone to begin with. Because when it talks about what her monument looked like. It talks about how relevant her dress style of dress was to the time. And she's holding a, a parasol in that right hand. And if you look very closely at the pictures, you can still see the parasol laying up against her dress, but the hand holding the handle is missing. Mm-hmm. So I think there's lots of stories that kind of get told from person to person and everybody kind of adds their own spin on it. And so, you know, when you're looking at that, you kind of have to say, okay, well, here's what's told, but here's at least the facts that we can deduce them from the the information that we have. One thing that does bother me is the story of James's uh, casket that he had specially made that was in the lobby of the hotel. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, if there is, if that is indeed fact, um, why would he have such a casket made that was set up for him to be able to get out of if he was buried alive? 
And I think that that kind of goes back to the fact that being buried alive was a very serious fear that a lot of people had back then. But, you know, even today, you know, you hear stories of, you know, somebody waking up in a morgue. They thought they were dead and they took them to the morgue and it turns out that they weren't. I, th I think that's just a, a really common fear. Well, there's a lot of, you know, literature that we teach that talks about um, people be being buried alive. Mm -hmm. Correct me. Uh, what's the time period on this story? Is it early 1800s? Early 1800s. Okay, so the one thing I was going to reference here is from 1937, and a gentleman named Thomas Purcell, who was a firefighter, had the nightmare of being buried alive, and he created basically an escape hatch uh, to ventilate the coffin from the inside with a wheel lock. Uh, he passed away in 37 at 83 and was buried along with provisions, but there are no signs that he's tried to get out. But, yeah, so it is a real thing that has happened for a long time. People have been worried about being buried alive. Well, that tracks, because I went back and looked at my notes. It wasn't early 1800s. It was the later 1800s, because James died in 1939. And so oh, wow. that really, I mean, that matches up really well. Well, this would have been around the same time. My great-grandpa used to tell me a story about being at a wake. And, you know, they were you know, setting up with the body and, you know, whatever you do. I've never been to one, but, you know, I've heard stories. But he was talking about sitting up with the body and the body was sweating. And he didn't think anything of it at the time. Oh, I'm not a medical person, but I'm, I, I just don't think bodies would sweat. I mean, in my opinion, I know that they do things, but I didn't think sweating would be one of them. As he got older, he kind of thought maybe that's not what should be happening. The person was buried. And then he kind of questioned that later on, you know, as he got older and started learning more things. And so then I hear that story and I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, you know, that that and that kind of became a fear for me. Mm -hmm. And that kind of, that you know, the literature that we teach, um, follow the House of Usher. Oh, yeah. Where he buries his sister alive. Cask of Amontillado. Yes. Um, all of that's been prevalent throughout literature. Mm hmm. I think it's really interesting, too, when we think about how James was such a history buff. And we think about his hotel and how it was kind of like a mini museum. And it has all these stories and rich history. Um, and I, I think it's one of the things that we read talked about how there was a story that he used to tell. And he used to tell this story about how this woman was walking with her child and someone watched a boulder kind of roll down a hill and land on the woman and child, killing them. And so the, the story goes that the boulder is still there and that the woman and child are buried underneath it because they weren't able to move the boulder to retrieve their bodies. And apparently this is a story that James was really fond of telling. He liked to tell this story because he was such a huge history buff and the boulder did exist there in that location and he thought that the the ghost story aspect of it was really interesting and so one of the theories that is talked about with the story is that maybe in him telling that story again and again over his lifetime that somehow that morphed with the story of his wife and how she passed away because you know one of the the ghostly things about the story he told was that oh sometimes at night you could hear the woman crying or the baby crying and her looking for her child and then again with the story being told about the graveyard about how people would hear baby cries at night mm -hmm. or crying uh, women in the graveyard and so it's like maybe those two stories have kind of been superimposed over one another over the years that does make sense yeah so this is kind of like an urban legend and we know that urban legends there's a little bit of truth mm -hmm. um and then it's mixed with some you know embellishments and the main thing about emerge a, a urban legend is to teach a lesson to you know don't do this or don't do that stay away from this i'm not sure what our lesson would be here though if this was an urban legend um, don't bury people alive. Yeah. I, mean, I don't. I don't. I'm not sure what our lesson could be from this. So I do get an urban legend vibe from it, mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm I'm having trouble figuring out what our lesson would be. Yeah. Well, and too, when we think about that, talking to people in the Pikeville area, you know, apparently this is pretty widely accepted. I mean, looking at. Uh, one of the museums at the time that even talks about like the, the natural history of Pikeville, this is frequently covered there, but the Hatcher family, even today is kind of like, you know, this didn't happen. Wish you would stop telling this. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we know that the story of how Octavia's hand was broken off of her statue. We, they found out very quickly how that was happening that, you know, there is a university of Pikeville and 
college students were going out there and, you know, around Halloween and, and turning her statue around kind of as a prank. And that was how the hand got broken off of the statue. And so then after that happened, descendants came in and raised it on this big tall pedestal so it can't be reached anymore. And after that happened and they put a large gate around mm-hmm. the cemetery, you know, it doesn't turn around and spin anymore. So that was kind of debunked through that. Right. Well, listeners, I think we can all agree that whether this is an actual haunting or an urban legend with some truth mixed in, it is indeed the tragic story of a mother and a child taken too soon and a grieving father and husband left behind to mourn their loss. And listeners, we would love to hear your thoughts on this story. Do you think that Octavia really was buried alive and that she still haunts the town of Pikeville today? Or do you think this is urban legend? Um, really, tell it. We want to want you to tell us what you think. While you're telling us what you think, you have an exciting opportunity this week. We are going to have a giveaway for our very first Haunted Haulers merchandise. And so we created a Haunted Haulers t-shirt. And if you want to see a picture of what it looks like, it's on our Facebook page. And it's also on our Instagram. And in order to enter this giveaway... All you have to do is go either to our Facebook page or our Instagram page or holler at us on Twitter and share your thoughts about this story and let us know what you think really happened. Next time on our next episode, we will take those of you who share your thoughts. We'll put you into a drawing and we'll draw a name during the next episode to see who wins the t-shirt. You can contact us via Facebook at Haunted Haulers. We are also on Instagram at Haunted Haulers, and you can even find us on Twitter, at Haunted Haulers. We do have a website, www.hauntedhaulers.com, and you can email us at hauntedhaulers at gmail.com. Until next time, listeners, beware of things lurking in the shadows. <laughs>